Hey guys, it's the Diesel Queen. Welcome to my overhauled podcast. I have to make an apology to you guys. My first few podcasts were a little screwed up. Long story short, it had to be kind of cropped down a little bit because I am technologically challenged. Back to how I am a heavy equipment mechanic, not a professional YouTuber or a podcaster. So please bear with my fuck ups and enjoy these podcasts. Again, I apologize. I'm a heavy equipment mechanic trying to make podcasts, so bear with me. Hey guys, this is Melissa with Overhauled. I am here today with a very special guest. I've known her for years on social media. She has worked her way up from a mechanic into running her own business. Um, I'd like to introduce you guys, Cummins Cowgirl. So can you introduce yourself and kind of explain a little bit about your career path and how you got into the industry and what you're doing right now. Howdy y'all, I'm Chloe Yonker, also known as the Cummins Cowgirl on all social media platforms. I started in the industry as a heavy duty diesel mechanic that wrenched for a Peterbilt dealership here in my hometown. So that's kind of where I started in the industry. And since then I've been going towards um, doing custom builds. So I've kind of veered from the heavy duty diesel life to Jeeps, off-road vehicles, UTVs, and pickup trucks. So yeah, that's kind of a gist of what I'm doing now. Well, you were just in SEMA this year, weren't you? We just got back a couple of weeks ago. So it's been after SEMA, it's like you push everything off leading up to SEMA and then you're gone for a whole like week and a half and then you have to catch up on everything. So it's just like a mad dash of stuff to do, but it's a hundred percent worth it. SEMA is a, is an amazing time. And for anyone interested in automotive industry, I highly recommend going at least once for sure. Just to experience it. Absolutely. Did you, did you go to, did you have a build entered into SEMA? Yeah, we took the uh, 2021 Jeep Wrangler JL uh, Eco Diesel. So that was there with the air design booth. It was outside of West Hall. So we had the Wrangler there this year and then the Gladiator was there last year. Nice. So you've had two years of entering vehicles into SEMA. That's, yeah. that's awesome. My first year was last year and that was a, a huge door opener. So it's been nice and we already have two builds promise for next year so i'm like we got to start now because it's gonna come fast it always does is your uh is your white pickup gonna be one of them so i have a couple of builds actually that i'm in the works um maybe i can squeeze my tow rig in there too but the main one that i'm focusing on is my 97 second gen so nice nice second gen world yes team second gen <laughs> but at least uh hopefully we'll get that back together and then the other build is a side by side for axe wheels nice awesome so what kind of what made you decide to take the steps of i'm working in a shop for, you worked on semis correct yeah peterbilt what made you decide to make that transition from I'm working for somebody else, working on semis. It looked like you enjoyed what you were doing. Um, what made you decide to transition into trying to start your own business, doing your own builds, stuff like that? So for me, um, I did enjoy my job a lot. I loved the dealership. I loved where I was at. I loved the people I worked with and the management there was like top notch, excellent. The What came down to it was kind of like, the the I don't even know how to say it like the financial side of it and then being your own boss so mm -hmm. what was really hard for me is that at the time I was traveling to shows almost almost every weekend so yeah. it was hard to have a full-time job at a dealership and then still travel and do all of the social influencing content creating job mm -hmm. So um, that was really hard to do both because I can't have a truck torn down in my bay and that customer needs that vehicle and I'm gone. So yep. it was really difficult to do. And so I was originally actually going to just quit and pursue just social media. And then they were like, actually, let's have you part time. 
So then I tried that for a while. And then ultimately it was just time is money. So yeah, spending a lot of time that I could be spending elsewhere was the biggest thing. And then obviously just the flexibility of having my own schedule. So I'm a night owl like no other. <laughs> so my most productive time of my day is like from 10 p.m. to like one in the morning. <laughs> And wow. I know it's so weird. Yeah, so weird. So I do a lot of my like video editing and stuff like that at that hour. So it was really okay. hard to have that and also be uh yeah. Be up at freaking seven in the morning. Yeah. Yep, I feel that. The push was just the schedule and just having my time. So well, and you didn't quit the industry. You know, you didn't stop being a mechanic because you're you're still doing it. You're just doing it under your own roof in your own shop. So, you know, I, I see when you first decided to leave the industry, it was kind of similar to when I did. Um, you know, you get a lot of people that are like, oh, my God, you you quit. Oh, my God, you're horrible. And it's like, no, I'm trying to build my own thing. And you prove them wrong. You show them. You're like, no, I'm still doing this shit. I'm just doing it for myself, which is way, way better than working for somebody else. So It's definitely more rewarding, I think. For sure. Well, it's got to be a pride thing. You know, yeah. you go to SEMA and you're like, this is mine. I built this. This is mine. You know, that's cool. And then the cherry on top is just like, I'm 25 year old female who can do yep. it on my own. So therefore yep. anybody else, can, you know, exactly. if you have the work ethic and you have the passion, you can do anything really. So that's kind of the point that I make to a lot of younger people that want to enter the industry or they're not sure. I had a young lady on here, which is my first episode after the one I do with my boss. And she's like 17 and she wants to be a mechanic, but she's got all these questions about, you know, the industry and like, how do you handle it when you mess up? And so I told her is if you show up and you try hard, you will go a long ways in this industry. That, that is like the two, that is the only two requirements that shops have is show up and try hard. That's all they want. You know, the only mistakes you make is if you make them twice, right? Like everybody learns. I've been having everybody on this show just for shits and giggles tell me what their biggest mistake was just to kind of show people like everybody fucks up, right? Everybody has, and every mechanic has this one story or two stories where like, oh my God, this is like. I, I questioned my entire existence today. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think we all do, especially those first three years in the industry. You feel like you fuck up everything you touch. You're harder on yourself than your boss is sometimes, you know. I had my boss in my first shop I worked at tell me multiple times, like, he'd come out and he wanted to yell at me for something and he'd look at me. And you're like, he's like, you're being harder on yourself than I was going to be on you. So just don't beat yourself up for more than like 15 minutes because we got other shit to do. But I'm going to go back in my office. <laughs> so what made you decide in the first place to enter into being a heavy duty mechanic? So I have a very like non-traditional route of how I ended up where I did. <laughs> So I actually got into the dealership as a management intern originally. Really? Yes, because I went to a four-year university and got a business degree. Really? And, yeah, yeah, dude. So I actually wanted to drop out halfway through my degree to go to a trade school for diesel mechanics. And my counselor basically said, "You're like, that's ridiculous. Don't do that. That's stupid. So I stuck it out, got my bachelor's degree, and then went to that dealership as a management intern. Two months in, they stuck me in the sales office and I was dying. I was quite literally dying. But actually it was a blessing because that was when I started my Instagram because I had so much time on my hands because yeah. I wasn't doing anything. So I was like, oh, this is brutal. I was basically just my job title was to take titles and registration to the DMV. Like that's really all I kind of did all day. Oh so it sucks. And I'm <laughs> like a, I'm a very fast paced person. So being behind yeah. a computer was driving me nuts. So then they swapped me to the service department 
and tried my feet out as like a service advisor. And I liked it a lot more, except for the fact that it was still a white color job. Yeah. And I would go in there and I talked to the techs and all the guys and I'm like, that's where I want to be. Like I would yeah. much rather be in the shop. So I kept bugging my service manager about it. And I was like, please just let me try it out. Please, please, please. Like, and he quite literally laughed in my face a couple of times. <laughs> And I went, I remember going to lunch with him and he asked me like the order of standard size. And I was like, I don't know. Cause at the time, I didn't know either. I didn't know either. That. Yep. And so it made me feel like he did it intentionally to make me feel dumb, but I took that as a challenge. And so I kept bugging him and I was like, please just let me try it. He's like, okay, we'll try you in the shop for a month. And then two and a half years later, I was a level three tech and quit and started yeah. my own shop. Fuck so yeah. that's how it all happened. But I didn't go to school for it. I had no prior training, specifically in heavy duty. All I, all I had worked on in my life was my second gen, which was a 12 yeah. valve. And the first thing I ever did was change an alternator. And I shocked the shit out of myself because I didn't disconnect the batteries. Like I was YouTube certified, like no oh end. Gosh. That's awesome. <laughs> like that's what my level of knowledge was. So we've started from the bottom. Now we're here. <laughs> but lots of just absorbing a knowledge like a sponge. Yep. Asking the the um, head techs millions of questions to the point where you feel like you're so annoying, but that is how you learn. You Absolutely. Learn by, you learn by trial and error. You learn by hurting yourself. Trust me, I have plenty of scars from that. I've got stitches. Yep. Where not to stand, <laughs> what not to do, how not to lift things that are stupid heavy, and use your tools that are intended for what they're used for. <laughs> you mean you, you're you not supposed to use a screwdriver as a chisel? Well, I definitely yeah. do that. But um, <laughs> pry bars are your best friend when it comes to heavy lifting stuff. Like mm -hmm. You can get a lot done with a pry bar and a ratchet strap. Oh, yeah. Oh, yep. yeah. Well, in your, in your shop, you didn't have a crane. Like, I, my little spoiled ass had a crane, so. <laughs> you had to figure out how to use the lots of different physics in your favor. <laughs> so I'm sure you've gotten asked this question a million times. I've been asked this question a million times and I don't really want to ask you because it drives me crazy to get asked this, but I want to give you a chance to answer this question is what did you, I guess, if you did ever run into an issue specifically with being a woman? In my shop, no. Was I stereotyped? Yes. Not specifically by the people I worked with, but mostly by customers. The amount of times I will walk in there head to toe, like caked in dirt and grease and grime, and they still had the audacity to ask me, what do I do? <laughs> right. What do you think I do? What the fuck does it look like? Like, ah. Uh. Just because I have blonde hair doesn't make me any much less of a tech than any of the guys out here. So that was one thing that kind of really was stressing me out. But um, the weird things were when I was starting to grow my social media and they knew where I worked, then it could kind of get a little creepy because yep. I, I tried to separate as much as I possibly could my social media from my work life. So like, I didn't want people to be coming into the dealership with the thought of them, like... Fanboying over you? Yeah. yeah. That was that's just weird to me. So I'm just like, please don't do that. And I had amazing service advisors that flagged a lot of that contact. So that was never a thing. I remember going in the shop a couple times and then being like, aren't you the girl from TikTok? And I'm like... Son of a gun. Yes, I am. Yeah. And then I like get all shy and then I leave because I don't like the mixing of my professional yeah. job with my social media job. Like, yeah. I don't know. But no, I get that completely. <laughs> all in one now because I work for myself. But at the yeah. time, I just didn't like that. Because well, it's embarrassing, right? To have these freaking creepy 
people show up at, at your job, at your place of work where, yeah, I get that. I've, act, I've not had somebody, well, I've, I've had somebody show up to my work, not specifically to talk to me, but like, I, I have a story, like the haunted equipment shop I worked at in Wyoming, uh, right when they were first opening, that was the last construction dealership I worked at. They, we helped set that up. It was a brand new building and we had some contractor guy in there. He was do. it was an office guy of all people too. He was like in there working for on the printers or some shit. And I walk up to the front to go get something. And he's like, I'm like doing shit at my boss's desk. And my boss say, thank God had a great sense of humor at the time. And he walks up to me and he's like, Hey, uh, you don't know me, but I know you. And it's like, like total fucking creep. I don't think he meant to be that creepy, but my boss would not let that shit go for months. He made fun of me for that for months. But <laughs> this guy, like, it did the same thing, like, out of the a million ways to approach somebody that you've met on social media. Because I've been approached before. You know, like, oh, hey, you're like the diesel queen. I know you. Like, out of all the ways to approach somebody, he chooses that. It, uh, why? <laughs> I've also had somebody call, like, I've had somebody from LinkedIn, of all sites, call my boss, same boss, great sense of humor, thank God, called my boss and asked to speak to me. And then when my boss told him, uh, go fuck yourself, he then said, hey, what if I fly down and have a meet and greet from Texas, from Texas, and my boss is like, yeah, good fucking luck with that. You are not welcome in this dealership. He, I don't think he said that, said it in that manner, but Thank God he had a good sense of humor. I was giving shit for that for like two months. My boss made fun of me for months over that. He's like, oh, I'm going to go set up a meet and greet at the truck stop down, down the street. And like, he's like, and like, he's like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge him $5 for a signature and then I'm going to go buy beer. I'm like, you suck. But I mean, so I totally get that. And that's the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about because you uniquely have the same issues as I do. You're big on social media. I, I did actually, you covered, kind of covered it for me. I wanted to cover, like, do you get people trying to intervene with your social life or your socials to your work and how that was handled? And that's because I, you have like a hundred thousand, over a hundred thousand more followers than me on Instagram. And I don't know what your TikTok is at, but people, I think, underestimate the power of social media and how many people you can reach. Like, even videos that do, don't do that good on our TikTok, you know, it might reach 10,000 people and we're like, or 10,000 views, right? And we're like, fuck, that was horrible. That's still 10,000 people. That's a lot of people to reach. And as many doors as that opens up, there's also a lot of weird shit that can go along with that. I'm, I don't even want to know what your met- message requests look like because I know what mine looks like. So <laughs> I used to do a thing called Blast Them Mondays. I'm where I would, I would post all the weird messages I get on my story just to like brighten people's Mondays because <laughs> it's just hilarious. But I kind of went away from that because I felt like some people actually want the attention. They wanted to be posted. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like if you don't stoke the fire, then maybe it'll help. So I mean, I, I have a lot of like filtered words through all of my social media comments too. So certain emojis, yeah. um, certain keywords, just so that it's less of me having to sift through it because I really try to push um, a PG type of version of social media because I know that I do have younger audiences watching. Yeah. Like my, my thought process is if, if I post this, am I okay with my neighbors seeing it, my my nieces and nephews seeing yep. it? Like, yes, um, we as women we want to pre- like we want to be confident. I get that, yeah. but at the same time, I want to be a role model. That's yep. really what the best word is. So um, I want to show that you can be, you can feel sexy, you can be confident, you can dress the way you want within a certain level of decency as well yeah so that's where i'm just like 
I try to use that with my um, social media as well because I don't want people scrolling through comments and there being a ton of profanity, um, just suggestive comments. Facebook yeah. is really bad about that. And <laughs> Facebook's the worst. Facebook and YouTube are savages. And I'm like, yeah. why are we this way? So, yeah. yeah, that's kind of how it is. But yeah, there's a lot of times where even I've been kind of down just by some of the keyboard warriors and what they say. Mm -hmm. But, and it's sad because it's like that one out of a hundred. And right. that one it's like guts you. Yeah. But you forget about the other 99 that were all positive. So, yeah. Like you said we're the hardest on ourselves so it's really difficult when you like portray your whole life to the world because people are so quick to judge and not ask questions yeah well and like you said they're keyboard warriors they're you know they would never ever say that shit to your face ever you know it's just because they're sitting behind a computer screen that they're like oh my god i'm gonna and I've gotten that before. Like, I'm sure you've gotten this too. I can't fucking win. If I post a done up picture, because I love, I'm the same way as you where I love to show women that you, you can be feminine and still be a mechanic. You can wear, you can be dressed to the nines in a dress and heels and makeup. And then five minutes later, you can go be ripping an engine out of a truck. I love doing that. But... <laughs> It's it's one of two things. I either get bitched at because, oh, my God, your hands are too clean to be a mechanic. Or I get bitched at because my hands are dirty and they're like, don't you know what gloves are? And it's like, or I wear gloves and then they bitch about that. I was just about to say that. I'm like, it's either you're too dirty or you're not dirty enough. Like, yep. I'm done. I'm done with you people. Come on. <laughs> right? Like, right? This is ridiculous. So, yeah, I 100% agree. You're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't. Whether you wear gloves, whether you don't. Whether you wear this, whether you don't, whether you're wearing yoga pants in the shop or jeans in the shop, whether yep. you're wearing what it doesn't matter. Like, yep. Well, and I never like, as you know, when you work in a shop, somebody else runs, they have uniforms. You don't get to choose what your uniform is. You wear what they fucking give you. And usually it's men's clothes. Right. And obviously like 99% of my content for into up until three months ago was in a shop like somebody else's shop so I was wearing like the work jeans and the work shirt and I've seen people bitch about your leggings before and it's like I go and work in my own shop yeah I've worked in my own shop and worked in leggings and I get the same it's like dude it's fucking comfortable for me I'm not running a torch you know if I'm going to be running a torch or a welder yeah I'm not going to be wearing fucking leggings right but if you're just doing a fucking break job and it's hot as fuck because it's like 99 degrees plus humidity, I'm going to wear my goddamn leggings. <laughs> yeah. I do a lot in my, I'm in Texas. So in the summers, we don't have the luxury of an air conditioned shop. So there's a lot of videos of during the summer of I'm literally wearing a sports bra and leggings working yep. in the shop and just drenched. I'm like dripping in sweat. Like I'm yep. gross. And people have so much to say. And I'm just like, have you ever worked in a shop where you're just like, you can't turn on a, on a fan because it's just blowing hot air. Yeah. So like, it is what it is. I mean, yes, there are times where, like you said, if I have to weld or it's like PPE and stuff like that, then that makes sense. But when I'm just wiring at a million rock lights, yeah, like that, I yeah. want to be comfortable, you know? So yeah, I feel that. I definitely feel that. Yeah, it's, I didn't, I, I worked in Wyoming, obviously, up until February when I moved to Indiana. And we didn't have the humidity. It got hot, but we didn't have the humidity. And it was always windy. So even like the hot days were pretty bearable. I come to Indiana and it's like 85 degrees plus humidity and that's not even the hottest days. And I have sweat rolling down my back. And God, did I wish I could have just worn leggings to work that day in a fucking sports bra, you know? And then I started working in my own shop. And I'm like, I'll be damned if I'm going to wear fucking jeans and a long sleeve shirt when it's like 110 degrees. And yeah, but the keyboard warriors, they always got something to say. And it's, 
yeah, like you said, sometimes it's hard to, and that's another reason why I wanted to talk about social media is because there are a lot of young women that have the same issues as we do on social media. And I've watched girls, and regardless of whether or not they're mechanics or not, I've watched women get completely fucking destroyed by, like, two people that are harassing them, and then they quit, like, all of their social media. And it's it's sad to see, but it's the sad reality of social media, and you got to be careful what you say because cancel culture can come after you. And as you know, it is not fucking easy to build 380 thousand followers that you have it's it's not hard or it's not easy to do that it's really fucking hard especially on instagram to build that empire and that is actually your livelihood too because that is all of your advertisement for all your business so it's people don't understand that that you're not just like oh my god this creator has to start over it's not just that it's this person's livelihood and how they make a living and how they advertise their business just got destroyed. And people don't get that. They're like, well, they're just a, they're just a creator. It's fine. No, it's not. Cause some of us are trying to run a business off of social media. Yes. There's so many things I can add. I'm just like, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head, like with everything. And the, the ones that hurt the most is when it's coming from other women. Dude, the, the women are the worst. Women are freaking ruthless. Yes. It's one I thing if it's like the whole mansplaining and kind of just like guys who are insecure kind of thing. Yeah. It's a whole other ordeal when it's another female that you're just like. And specifically, women truck drivers, shockingly, are are kind of savage. And I'm just <laughs> like, like, I remember so many times where I've, I've uploaded a, a video where I'm at a big rig show and for some reason, TikTok just loves videos of people opening hoods. I don't know why they're just amazed by that. But I had done like, I was in, I was doing a photo shoot. So I was in like a crop top with a skirt. I've seen just, that. Yep. Yeah, just opening a truck hood and they just murdered me in the comments. And I'm like, you don't even take the time to go to my profile and see that I'm quite literally a mechanic. Yeah. Like, yep. what? You're yep. so hard to judge what I'm wearing, which- It's because you're pretty. They're mad at you because you're pretty and you look better than they do opening their hood of the truck. And it's like, but it's like, why not support that? Why not be like, oh my God, you look fucking awesome. I can't believe you're doing that in fucking heels. That was my thought process when I saw that video. I was like, oh my God, you're doing that in heels? My dumb ass would be over, yeah, because I worked, <laughs> you know, it's, why, why tear that down? And you're, you're totally right with the women are the worst sometimes on supporting each other. Like, I uploaded a video, um, or I posted a video or a picture. I posted something on Facebook, um, and she was, she freaked the fuck out over how I'm not being a role model for young women and I just want the attention and I'm just fake and like all like giant fucking paragraphs about how horrible I am and all the stuff. And it's like, but why are you commenting then? There's, there's this really cool thing called scroll. Um, it, it works great. Actually, you can just skip right over it and continue on to the next post. But my followers tore her apart. Oh, um, I bet. That's the I best follow. part because when everybody just has your back and then they rip them a new one and I'm just like, I don't even have to fight this battle Yeah, because I've already proved myself over and time and time again. So if you have a problem with me, then take it up with me. Like, I don't mm -hmm. understand why what I'm doing is hurting you. Exactly. And it was like the same thing over my shop attire that I was wearing and it's she she was bitching because she's like well a real mechanic would be in jeans and long sleeve shirts I don't know if I believe that you're you're not setting a good example I'm like um a this is a photo shoot and like or like a tiktok video right like this is as you know 
when you're in the social media business, you have to follow the trends for some stuff. And you got to post what helps get you views. I know people fit, hate on that, but it's also a business. That's how you're trying to run your business. I told her, I was like, look at my YouTube. Okay, L look at my actual YouTube. It is full of videos of me working on stuff and actually working on stuff in a shop. And I'm in like jeans and a tank top or like I made a bunch of videos when I was in an actual shop. So I was in my uniform and it's like, you can't, first off, why'd you make a comment in the first place? Why was, why was my post that important to you? Like I'm flattered, but why? And it's, it's ridiculous, but it's, you're no, it's never going to end. So that's kind of the point that I wanted to get across. Like some of the young women or e young, anybody who's just getting into the industry of social media and trying to, you know, do that is it's everybody gets that. It's not just you, you know, you're not, these people don't just hate you. I promise they hate everybody. So it's, yeah, it's kind of sad, but it is what it is. You gotta have thick skin. Yep. And that's, that's the other thing is like, even in a shop, like I, it sounds like your shop experience is very similar to mine where the guys were awesome. You know, the people were awesome. It was a great environment. Um, but there's a lot of stories that I've heard of not even just women, but young people entering the industry in general, but they get there and everybody's talking shit and they're like, Oh my God, they hate me. It's like, no, they don't hate you. It's, just that's the environment of a shop. Yeah, with a shop, you kind of have to just like, they're more of your family. And like, exactly. I feel like the, it was more of kind of like a, a relationship as far as like a sibling kind of. I don't know. They're all like a family. It's just kind of like you pick on each other and you roll off the punches. Well, you spend eight to 10 hours a day with each other, right? Like, yeah. So it, at, at some point, like, and it, it's also a shop full of guys and they give everybody shit. They're constantly talking shit to each other. So it's, it's free entertainment. I, I had an old mechanic that I used to work with when I first entered the industry. And he always told us, he's like, I'm surprised we even get fucking paid for this shit. It's like an adult daycare. Yeah, yeah it kind of is. But so what do you think in your opinion and what do you think is a key or a direction, I guess, that people in the industry can follow to try to get more people into this industry? Um, I, I'm a big advocate of like exactly what you and I are doing already, right? Social media has a big audience and that is one of the best places to advertise like, hey, this industry exists, you can be in this industry, and here's realistic expectations of being in this industry. Um, but what other things do you think or feel that we are either lacking in a society, lacking in high schools, or need to help get people into this industry? As far as in um, high schools go, and, and this is based off experiences that I have personally kind of seen or witnessed, I suppose, is that I get quite a few messages from younger generations who just like, like you said, high schoolers mm -hmm. who are interested, but they don't know how to get their foot in the door. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest stumbling block is the fact that it's like, it is hard to get into the door. I will, like I had said, I shared my story of how I started very unconventional ways. So it's like really hard for me to try to give pointers because I mean, I, I'm just a very stubborn person and that's how I was able to get in. But not everybody's like that. And not only like you have to have someone actually take a chance on you with <laughs> the way I did it. So, I mean, I what, what I can suggest is just ask a lot of questions to people you trust work like you said show up and like just work hard honestly if you show that you actually are putting effort into what you're doing they're gonna notice that like they're gonna mm -hmm. see that you're trying even if like you said you mess up it is what it is everybody messes up you know yep. but right from the get-go i 
when I look back on where I was in high school, I really wish I had gone to um, like the, uh, I don't remember what it was called in high school, but there was like certain ones where you had like shop, you had welding, you could do the electives and stuff. Yeah. So I didn't take advantage of that because I didn't know at the time that was something I'd be interested in, honestly. And so that was kind of what I wish I had gone through was taking the time and just experiencing a lot of different things. I was so set on just getting as many college credit hours as I could in high school. And now I regret it because I could do so much more with a trade than I ever could with two credit hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I feel like thinking back on that sense, I wish I had done differently. So that's why I want to kind of like share that with others so that they can also kind of put that in perspective as well. That if you learn a trade, that is something that you can't get taken away from you. You yeah. know what I mean? Whereas like credit hours are just kind of like you're going to pay a bunch of money for college and then have debt. Like yeah. it is what it is really is yeah. whereas having a trade you can just have a GED and go and make twice as much than anybody else without at 18 too not like you know I was making well above minimum wage right out of trade school which I went to a trade school it was not a community college or anything it was a strict trade school and right out of that I was making well above minimum wage in a shop and I had a job before I left the trade school and it was, yeah, it, I, I agree with that. And I've, I've talked to a couple people now. I've talked to a couple people that have gone the route of trade schools. And I've talked to a couple of people that were like, I just kind of tried some stuff in high school and I liked it. So I entered a shop and said, teach me. Exactly. And it's both ways work. Like having real life experience, I feel like almost sometimes is actually more beneficial. Oh, yeah. Because go to an employer and be like, I've been working on this, 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 and this, and this for this long, and these are the skills I know and are working on mastering. Whereas, like you said, fresh out of trade school, everyone's going to have a different level of knowledge, even yeah. going to the same school, just oh, yeah. based on experiences and practicing and, and everything else. So I guess all in all, what I can, what I would sum that up as is just kind of take life experiences and try lots of different things. Cause you may never know what you will enjoy. Like quite literally. So do you think if employers or advocates, I guess of the industry call it trade school colleges, do you think if they went to high schools and put on a little seminar thing for stuff like that, that would have helped you? And that's something that you would have seen or would did you have to actually get your hands in it? Like in, in my high school, it was required. You had to take an automotive class to pass. Uh, and, and you had to take either a woodworking class or a welding class to pass. You had to graduate. So that in that sense, like I've told people stories millions of times before of like the, there's so many kids in that high school that would have never even thought to touch an automotive class or a welding class elective. Cause oh, that's what I did with welding. Cause I hate woodworking and all those kids in that, like a good 80% of the kids in that, even in Wyoming would not have ever touched a, tra- a elective like that, but they had to. So then they have that knowledge of like, Hey, I can do this. I can do something with my hands. But that's a rare occurrence, and it's just getting more rare and more rare because high schools are just dropping – they're dropping the electives in general, let alone making them mandatory. So I'm trying to figure out, like, how can people like diesel laptops, for example – that's part of the point, obviously, of this podcast is to try and get the industry out to people and young people and people that failed out of college that don't know what they're supposed to be doing with their life. But how – I mean, what – do you think it would help to have more physical people in high schools and with young people telling them about it? Or do you think that's kind of like kids need to figure it out for themselves? So in my opinion, this is just my social media mindset opinion of the marketing side. 
I see like my younger siblings and I see how much time they spend on devices. <clears throat> and I feel like, sure, you could try to go into the schools, but I feel like you're actually going to reach more by doing something through social media or a sort of entertainment venue because Absolutely. that is what they're already locked in on. Yep. So they spend so much time behind a screen. That's the number one place that you're going to be able to put it in front of their face. So with that, I, I mean, like I said, I'm a social media guru and I have full um, faith in reaching people via social media. TikTok is a number one, I feel like social media app that really portrays what it is that we do. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you can do it with the whole trends and stuff, but that might be a little bit of a foot in the door as well. Like they're mm -hmm. just on a trending audio and they see us in the shop doing this funny like dance trend thing. And then they're like, Oh wait, what are they doing? And yep. you know, that's foot in the door is that so that's where i feel like comes a lot of the messages i get is because of social media and they saw something of me changing a tire yeah or doing an oil change and just stuff like that and so then they do a little bit extra you know of well what's this about so then mm -hmm. they go to your other social media platforms youtube those are longer videos so it just kind of depends because the, sh the attention span is about eight seconds. Yeah. So you kind of yep. have to hook yep. them right then and there and then keep them attentive with doing other fun things and the entertainment side. I do think that knowledge can also be entertaining. Yeah. You just have to be creative with, with mm -hmm. how it's portrayed. So that personally would be my recommendation is through social media outlets. And then I met two young men at SEMA that were there with their shop class. That's awesome. Please give your teacher a hug because I'm freaking jealous. Like, yep. I wish I had that growing up. So yep. it's like stuff like that where I'm like, dang, it's great to see others making it a priority. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like... Like, yeah, SEMA is expensive, but like the amount of knowledge that they're going to have and experience in those like one or two days that they're there is astronomical. And so seeing all the new technologies that are coming out and all of the like the whole industry as a whole is just like, whoa, there's a lot to offer, you know? Well, it's taken because as I'm sure you know, the technician shortage that was pretty bad when we started in the industry is now detrimentally bad you know like shops are right now they're trying to hire a warm body and that's and that's kind of the point i'm trying to get across to some of these kids is like dude there's so many opportunities they, these shops are paying you to go to college they're paying you to go to a trade school and then they pay you for your first set of tools and all you have to do is work in their shop for two years like, I wish I, I wish I would have known that when I was entering, like there's so many opportunities and they can do exactly what you did right now. They could walk into a shop and be like, I want to learn this. And most shops are going to be like, well, we're about five technicians short. So get your ass in there. Let's go. And there, there's so many opportunities for kids. And the, the only, the last question really, the last few things I want to cover is a do you think social media kind of romanticizes our job or in our trade? I feel like because a lot of people try on social media to portray only the positives, no one sees the negatives. Yeah. There's been several times where I came home and absolute tears just defeated because I thought I couldn't make it. And the only thing that truly kept me going was calling one of the other texts and just kind of just pouring my heart out in a way of like, do you think I can make it? Mm -hmm. And having a supportive person in your life like that is a huge thing because when you aren't strong enough to keep going, you need a shoulder to lean on. And 
you have to be strong just being on social media as it Absolutely. is. Absolutely, yeah. But there's a lot of stuff that even I haven't shared with the world because, I mean, I try to stay positive on social media because I don't want to be a negative Nancy because yeah. you know, so also kind of go on there just to kind of brighten their day. But mm -hmm. at the same time, they don't get the full story. You know what yep. I mean? So yep. I guess in a long-winded answer, yes, in a way, it does romanticize it. But you just have to know that, I mean, you're going to have oil baths. You're going to have diesel in your hair. Yes. Cool it in your face. Yeah. You're going to have bruises. You're going to have sprained ankles. You're going to have fingernails being ripped off. You're going to have it all. Yeah, you may as well give up on long fingernails because, I mean, at least for me, because I just, I can't keep them long at all so and the, i feel like the most frustrating is when you get that one truck and that you have no idea what the hell is wrong with it yep we've all been there Down, you're losing your ass and time on it by now you owe the customer money with how much you spend time in it like and you're just dying here drowning in your own like nonsense and yeah it sucks it does but then you also have those days where you just absolutely slaughtered a brake job and now mm -hmm. you're just rolling in dough. So yep. it's just like, you don't have to, it comes and goes. It is what mm -hmm. it is. I hope you like roller coasters because that is what being a mechanic is like. <laughs> that's so true. That is so accurate. And it's, that's what I tell kids all the time entering this industry. I'm like, dude, you're, I worked at John Deere for seven years. There is a lot of different types of equipment. And, and even like the ag side versus the construction side, people are like, oh, it's just John Deere. No, it's like, it's like two different fucking companies. Like the way they run shit, the way their manuals are set up. So the learning curve and semis, I'm sure are like this too, where, it, you know, it, the learning curve doesn't stop. But yeah, that's like kind of what I wanted to and talk about. And you made really good points is it is an emotional roller coaster. And like... I, even after I was in the industry solid for seven years, not including school, and I still had days where I'm like, oh, my fucking God. I've spent two days on this electrical diagnostic problem. I still don't know what the fuck's wrong with it. I, I, I've contacted DTAC, which is our engineers. I, I, I've asked every technician in the shop. And that's the other thing is ask for help. Like, the. You know, you're going to get shit when you first start out because you're like, oh, my God, you need your hand held. And then you're, you might get shit, but they're just – everybody's been through that where they're like, oh, my God, I'm struggling. And my, my biggest advice for people is exhaust your resources, right, before you ask for help. But if it's lining up pins on an excavator bucket or a coupler and it's going to take your dumb ass an hour – to go back and forth between running the machine and then looking at it and then running the machine and looking at it, try and line up the pins, or it's going to take 15 minutes for somebody else to help you ask for fucking help. Like, cause I was stubborn like that where I'm like, I want to do it all myself. I, I'm an independent person. I got this. And then you spend two hours doing something like that. And you're like, that was stupid. Now it would have looked better if I would have just asked for help. Now when I need like four hands, I'm under there looking like a, like a dog and a, I don't even know. Like a monkey over there holding a pry bar with my feet and beating with a hammer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are yep, been there. Makes great content, too. So it's like, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Well, I, I've made videos before where, like, it's been a while since I've been able to do it. But I have to stand on ratchet sometimes and jump on it to break shit loose. I've been there. Like, it's... But impacts, I, I love my three quarter inch impact. Me and that impact are my best friend. Like, we love each other because that fucking thing saves my life. Uh, like, t torquing head bolts on a 6090 or a 13 to 5, like, it's so tight that, like, the guys, some of the guys can just use fucking their half inch digital torque wrench and they're fine. No, I gotta use, like, for the torque turn. I got to use a big, long, giant fucking three-quarter inch ratchet, right? And then I have this little digital magnetic angle gauge I put on there. And then obviously I mark the bolts just to make sure because sometimes I forget to turn it on. But it's... <laughs> I've done it before where I've been touring and I'm like, wait, 
and then turn that on. And as you know, with torque turn, this has happened on axles because I lose track of sometimes like the flange bolts. I'm like, fuck. So I got to untorque it and then retorque the spec and then retorque the fucking degrees. And sometimes it's more than 190 or more than 160. So it's like, fuck. But yeah, it, that's the other thing is people ask me all the time, like, oh, you're so small. Like, how do you do it? I'm like, and the, the button on the crane works really great. Like, four jacks work really great. It's, you know, it's a trade. Yeah, I might have to ask for help or have a cheater bar or whatever on some things. But I'm also the girl they shove up a combine auger to put the motor in there because I'm the only person that can fucking fit. So <laughs> it's a trade. Oh, yeah. Fit on top of a transmission and in between the bottom of the cab and just yep. hope your bags don't deflate. Cause then you're gonna die. <laughs> All right, last question of the day: What is your biggest fuck up and your biggest like proud moment that you've had? Oh man! Ooh, there's so many <laughs> bad ones. I mean, like <laughs> I feel that. I guess it would depend on too, like at. Was it at the dealership or was it here? Like, I feel like there's totally different scenarios depending on where I was working. I think at the dealership, my, oh man, my biggest, I think the funniest one was I had a learning curve, you know, <laughs> you learn from mistakes, right? Yeah. It wasn't anything really catastrophic. It was just, I looked like an absolute moron. I was, I was quite literally just doing an oil change on a cat. And the drain plugs are like, I think an inch and a quarter. Like they're, they're pretty good sized drain. Oh God, I know where this is going. And I used an impact <laughs> into the bath, and like freaking 11 gallons or so of freaking disgusting ass oil. <laughs> when I tell you a bath, I'm not even lying. Like, the, and of course the pan, didn't fit perfectly underneath that bar that goes underneath. Mm -hmm. So I had it on the wrong side, so I couldn't grab it. So it was just like pouring and I had to take it out and come in from the side, which means around the whole as freaking tire. <laughs> By the time it was all said and done, I think only maybe like two gallons actually got into the drain pan and about like the marine the remainder were in my pants. Yep. So that. that really sucked and I looked ridiculous. But I learned a lesson that day. You didn't do it again, right? Just use a breaker bar and all of your might just leg press the shit out of it and break it loose. The best one, I think. I think my my biggest personal accomplishment was taking a fire damage truck and basically rebuilding the whole thing. It was like an oil field truck that they had retired. And then they wanted to bring it back to life. Well, it had caught on fire. And so the entire interior was just like stripped, like all harnesses had to be replaced, cab harness, ABS harness, like all harnesses. So that was a lot of plugs. <laughs> And basically it was just like, everything was torn off of it and pieces were thieved off of it because mm -hmm. they used it as a parts truck just to like yep. grab stuff off of for years. They towed it in the shop and they're like, here's your new child. And I was like, oh boy. Yeah, I'm married to this motherfucker forever. Oh yeah. yeah. It, like two months later, it was just awesome seeing the piles of parts just delivered on a pallet. It was like Christmas day. And I was just like, oh my gosh, what's this, what's this, what's this? And my ADHD mind was like, I don't even know what I want to work on first. Yeah. Like, do I do the inside? Do I do the outside? Do I work on suspension? Do I do engine stuff? I don't even know where to start. Like. This is a massive ass puzzle. So I think that was my biggest one was the day I backed it out of the bay and I was just like, oh. Yep. And I think that was definitely my biggest accomplishment at the dealership. And by far, I think the, the best moment for me was last year of backing out the Gladiator from the shop to load up to go to SEMA. Because that was my first ever SEMA build. I did it in two weeks. 
Jesus. From, we're talking lift kit, steering, full front end, an entire wrap. I had never wrapped anything a day in my life, so I was learning. How hard is that, by the way? If you're not a patient person, good luck. Oh, God. I was wondering about that because I want to wrap my truck, so. And if you're a perfectionist, <laughs> good freaking luck. Just have a lot of time on your hands and it's going to be okay, I promise. <laughs> So, yeah, that was a learning curve, too. Lots of lighting to do. I mean, a complete SEMA build in, like, two weeks. So That's pretty impressive, though, to have a SEMA-ready build in two weeks. By myself, dude. That's what the hardest part was, is that it, everything done, I had to do. Yeah. You know, like most people have a shop with a team. So yep. you have one person working on lights. You have one person doing the wrap, one person doing a suspension. Yep. And I'm doing it all simultaneously. <laughs> so it's yep. like it's, everything's just sitting on jack stands and you're just kind of having to figure out what to tackle first. Yep. And a lot of it is like you have to do stuff at the same time. So while this is getting done, you also have to work on this. And while this is not – ready you have to do this mm -hmm. or trying to delegate what little pieces I can have people actually help me with because I do yeah. have my sister who wants to help but doesn't know what to help with yeah like you get to loom rock lights <laughs> <laughs> that is something you can do that I don't have yep. to supervise. so I think a lot of that's also delegating help when you can find help yeah so it comes with a lot of I'm very OCD when it comes to if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Yep. But you're also not Wonder Woman, so you kind of have to just take help where you can get it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But there's a pride moment, right? When you pull that out of the shop and you're like, I did that. Like nobody else did that. I did that. That was me. Yep. And, and I think the best part is when you park it. And you stand back and you see everybody else looking at it, taking pictures, asking about it, complimenting on it. Like that to me is what is like the best. My favorite is seeing little kids just be like, look at that. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. stop it. It's cute. <laughs> like, oh. I love that. That's probably my favorite by far is when it's like, look at the monster truck. And I'm like, it's literally a six inch lift. Right. But they, like, like what little kids see is just like, their eyes are just like, they're just amazed. So yeah. that's cool.